space. 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 Let's go to space. Let's go to space. Ah, hello there. Welcome to episode 48 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. You guys have been suggesting Portal 2 for a very long time and I figure we should just give up on not doing Valve games and give you what you want. So with that said, let's get going. You know, you always gotta love a boundary break episode that just works right off the bat. Here at the very start of the game, we see ourselves going outside of this mock-up room that Shell has to stay inside for I have no idea how much time. But as you can see on the outside here, it says error. Now the funny thing about this little error message is I can't really explain why it's here. You could probably speculate pretty easily, but this error message is in nearly every single map that loads into this game. But anyways, what's really cool about this first area of the game is that we start off in this well-furnished room, go to sleep, and then wake up in a dilapidated version of that room. And as you can see here, those two rooms are completely separate and segmented off by a black wall. And also in this starting area, if you move the camera in just the right way, you can actually see an axis helper that the developers of Valve used while making this game. And oh my goodness, there's so much stuff at the start of the game. So only slightly adjacent from the current day room that we were in a second ago is a somewhat similar version only there's one texture that represents the entire room. Although some of the core elements are here, like the bed and the hallway that leads to the door, there are some elements here in this room that are different from the geometry that's in the final game. So now we're gonna take a look inside of Wheatley because to no one's surprise, there's actually some gizmos and gadgets inside this little ball-shaped robot. But of course, it's really difficult to get a good look inside of that body. So once we take the camera through, we can actually see how he operates. So one of the coolest things about my show is that I don't pretend to know everything. I like to learn with you, the audience. And sometimes, like Portal 2 itself, learning how the developers use certain tricks can be a puzzle as well. So with that in mind, we're looking at this beginning area here and we can see a backdrop that's clearly 3D. And when we go to move the camera towards that backdrop, the screen turns white. We essentially went into the white void. Now, it took me a good while to figure this out, but there's also an additional room that I thought was just simply not used in the game. I went down there to check it out, and it had a very unusual layout. Now, after looking back and forth between the room and the backdrop, the room and the backdrop, it suddenly dawned on me what this room actually was. And what it turned out to be was that it is the backdrop. And essentially what's going on here for whatever reason, developers did put the backdrop into the map, but the image of the map is projected and blown up to be the background for the player character as they go through the game. Outside of the boundaries for Portal 2 is fairly clean, so finding something out of bounds is a little unusual, which is why showing off this cube here in Test Chamber 4 is worth showcasing, because like I said, unless the game intentionally pushes something out of the boundaries, you'd be very lucky to find anything at all. That's an option. Option A, sit here, do nothing. Option B, go through there, and if she's alive, she'll almost certainly kill us. So now we're in a creepy hallway about to reunite with GLaDOS, and you may notice that this hallway is very mysterious and shady and foggy. Well, if we take ourselves outside of the hallway, you can still see a lot of shade and fog, which doesn't really help us out very much. So let's disable the fog and come to find out that it's just incredibly dark in here. So that still doesn't help us. How about we just make everything in this area completely bright? And oh, <laughs> it looks uh, it looks pretty hideous. I guess, you know what? I guess it's amazing what you can do with proper lighting and effects. All right, now we're looking at the queen bee herself, GLaDOS. And why are we taking a look at GLaDOS today? Well, because, I mean, how are you not gonna have GLaDOS in your Portal 2 video? Uh, duh. But more importantly, if we take the camera inside of her head, you can see that there's a water effect that splashes around inside of her circuitry. Very strange. And as you can see here, it can't be shown by just looking at her from the outside. Just a little quickie right here, I just want to show you this little lava room that GLaDOS drops you into. If you take the camera below the surface, you can actually see that the lava is just a nice clean rectangle. And then the environment itself shapes the lava. So 
So over here at test chamber three and many other chambers, but I just figured I'd use this as an example that you can see for yourself. Some areas of the game allow you to peek through the test chamber walls and see what's really going on behind the scenes. Once again, very mysterious, very ambiguous, and lots of darkness and fog. But if we take ourselves into one of these restricted areas and at the very least turn on the light for every object on the map, we can see the real size of this area as well as the true color of the walls that these objects are hanging off of, which is just a butt ugly yellow. So in all the elevators that lead up to the next test chamber, it's always accompanied by a very elaborate metal frame. And if we take the camera out of reach, we can actually see there's a surge button here, as well as an acronym that gets cut off by a sheet of metal. As you can see here, the floor bed is raised by a whole bunch of garbage. And since this is not a very common floor tile, it's pretty safe to assume that this is essentially a game prop. But what's really interesting is that when we take the camera below this pile of garbage, there's actually a cradle space made up of floor tiles. Another thing I've been holding off on talking about is these mysterious cubes. Now, typically these cubes will show up near every error sign. And what's really interesting about these cubes is that one of them will always warp you to the next map. Essentially, every time you've had to see a loading screen, it's loading the next map of the game. And like I said, one of these cubes will always bring you there. In many, many scenes, Wheatley comes out of nowhere on a little rail and just kind of gives you a little bit of dialogue, and then he just kind of scoots away into an area of the game that you're not allowed to follow him in. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you every single area that he's going to be in. That would just that would just take forever. But showing you this one scene gives you a little bit of an idea of what every single area kind of looks like. Essentially, once the camera bends outside the player's view, every single time, there will be a little wall there for Wheatley to just sit there and rest. Usually he doesn't disappear. Sometimes he does. But most of the time, he'll just kind of chill out in that one spot. Hey, hey, up here. I found some bird eggs up here. Just dropped them into the door mechanism. Shut it right down. I ah! Bird! 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 Wait a second, birds? No, I'm gonna have to check this out. So if we take the camera through to the scene that I consider the funniest in the whole game, you can actually see that there is a bird waiting to terrorize Wheatley. Now this bird is, again, one of the most primitive birds I've ever seen in my life. It essentially looks like a black paper airplane with no distinct features. But don't worry, viewer, there's actually more than one bird in Portal 2. Just dropped me to the door mechanism. Shut it right down. I ah! Bird! 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 So I've been asked to explain how the portals work in Portal 2, but to answer that, we need to talk about parallel universes. Which we definitely don't have time for on my show, so instead I'm just gonna show you what it looks like when Shell goes out of bounds, but also going through the portals at the same time. As you can see, the various versions of Shell actually do intersect with each other, because in four different instances, Shell is breaking the boundaries. So when four Shells break boundaries together, Shell breaks into herself 12 different times. Portal 2 is just riddled with a lot of fascinating elements. Stuff that didn't even need to be in the game, but they decided to work it in anyways. And one of those things happens to be the assembly line for the drones. At one point, you do see a box spring up from the bottom of the ground so that a drone can be placed inside, and then it sinks back down to the ground. Well, you'd be interested to find out that actually, if we take the camera below the ground, we can see that the box is never swapped out. It's just that same one box that goes up and down constantly. But it gives you the illusion that there's multiple boxes involved. Sneaky, sneaky. So this is a pivotal part of the game where Shell breaks a, some boundaries of her own, I suppose, and actually gets out of the tests that GLaDOS sets up for her and tries to escape with Wheatley. Now what's really, really weird here is that there's two separate rooms. One, which is the test chamber itself, and two, which is the test chamber combined with the behind the scenes area of the Aperture facility. Now again, I do not build myself up to make you believe that I know everything that goes on in a video game. So I can't really explain to you why Shell warps from this initial test room over to this other test room that has that elaborate scenario. One would think that you could just keep that room that's connected with the scenario and use the test room there. But that's not the case. At a certain point, you seamlessly transition over from that separate room over to the event room. And of course, I gotta satiate the curiosity of many folks out there. What is on the other side of that test chamber door that GLaDOS wanted you to go through? Well, the answer is just a solid black texture. I even cheated just a little bit to activate the door, open it, and try to go through it. And apparently behind that automatic door is a invisible wall, or a black wall in this case. Here's 
Here's a really funny part of the game where you can choose to go towards a very blatant trap. And if you go towards that trap, you get stuck inside the room and then you're gassed to death. But the bait here is clearly an exit out into the real world. Now in a normal game, you're never given a chance to get that close. Once you step inside the trap room, that door closes, everything locks you in and you're kaputs. However, with Magic Camera, we can see just how much of this quote unquote outdoors there actually is. And as you can see here, it's just two big plants and a light colored box that happens to have green lighting. And this is where its flight path ends. It flew off. Good for him. All right, back to thinking. And here's another example where lighting can completely change the way a landscape looks. As you can see, it's supposed to be dark and moody and foggy, but if we remove all those elements, it's a completely different place. And we're gonna actually zoom this area out because it's way larger than I thought it was gonna be. And from up above, it almost looks like a maze. It's not quite, but it's amazing how many walls there are and how much land there is to cover for an area that is so densely fogged and darkened. This little tidbit is absolutely exciting. This was recommended to me while I was on stream, and apparently, every time Wheatley's on a little LED screen, he's actually out of bounds somewhere in a black box. Essentially, the character model has to be on the map, so he can essentially be digitally televised in this digital world known as Portal 2. And the actual Wheatley that is being used to broadcast is only a small portion of what he's actually supposed to look like. Ah, but if we hoof it, we can still catch a little cameo from Peabody, the portal bot essentially. Now in this scene, you can see Peabody off in the distance and then he locks eyes with you for one moment and runs off into the test chamber exit. But if we take the camera over there, we can see exactly where he goes when he runs off. And as it turns out, he pretty much just disappears the second that he's off screen. So we're now at the end of the game and this gets kind of interesting. If we are to go into third person and activate the stalemate button, uh, yeah, it, it, it gets creepy. Shell just becomes a pair of arms that are actually connected to each other, which is really interesting, but still creepy. Space! Wait a minute, space? Where would space be on this map? Well, actually, it's not that far at all. It's directly below the final boss fight. However, you can't reach planet Earth. And I would have never thought to check for it because the out of bounds in this map is especially glitchy. But because of what we learned at the very start of the episode where background elements can be blown up but served from a different part of the map, I took the time to find it. It was very important to me because there's a certain character that just loves space. And I just wouldn't feel right inside without giving him what he wanted. Go to space, Dad. Dad, I'm in space. I'm proud of you, son. Dad, are you space? Yes, now we are a family again. Gordon, there you are. Yeah, I'm just as shocked as you are to be back here, but word's going around that it's for the 124th episode of Boundary Break, where the creator takes the camera basically anywhere to find secrets and new discoveries to video games. Hey, did you notice that warping while I was talking there? I don't get it either, Gordon, but it's been making me a little sick. Funny thing is, I hear if we thank Marfie Black for helping with the technical explanations and suggest getting on with the show, we should be able to escape this mess in about 15 minutes or so. So how about you and me can just jump into it and I'll meet up with you later. I still owe you a beer. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much, Mike Shapiro, for bringing back Barney to celebrate this week's episode of Boundary Break. But anyways, let's get started with the show. So I want to start off and end on this episode with some really strong stuff. And the first thing I want to show you guys is something that is completely unseen by the player, but is also integral to the lore of Half-Life. Now, there are two different versions of Half-Life you can play off of Steam, one of which is a slightly revised version by Gearbox, and that's the one that plays by default. But obviously, if you played the game way back in the day, you'd see that there is much different graphics for some of these characters 
characters, one of which being, of course, the G-Man. Now, I wouldn't have caught this at first if it weren't for Marfie Black to point it out to me, so I really want to thank you for that, sir. But what happens is, if you go into the old settings and check out the G-Man's briefcase, there's a detail to it that's not on the newer model, and that's that on the inside of the suitcase, there are two textures to represent what would be on the inside if you were to open that briefcase. On one side, there is a handgun as well as some pencils and some notepad paper. Very standard human-y type stuff, but then on the opposite side of the briefcase, there seems to be some sort of electronic device. On the right-hand side, you can see the G-Man's face, and on the left-hand side, you can see a black screen with green font. Now, it's really difficult to get a good look at all this stuff, so there are extracted textures here that I can give you a look at without the obstruction of the briefcase itself. And if you're looking for more hidden textures on character models, there are these assassins here. Now, here's the thing. I played for this section multiple times, and I've never been able to get the visor off, but again, Marfie Black let me know that in certain situations, you can get the visor to kind of come off of the character's face. That being said, there is a lot of us, I imagine, who have never seen the eyes of the assassin before. So taking the camera inside the visor will show you exactly what they look like. Quick explanation, when you visit a new area in Half-Life, you might notice that there's a little bit of a loading screen and then all of a sudden you're able to get to the next area. So what happens during this time? Well, what happens is you're loading in completely new maps. And when you're exiting the old map, it seamlessly transitions from one map to the other. And if you were to take the camera and look at the end of an old map, you'd see that just around the corner before you load the new map, it is just completely unfinished. Now, what's cool about this though, is that there's two instances where the environment from an old map doesn't match up with the environment of a new map. The first one I found was here in this hallway. In the first map, if you go over into the ventilation shaft, you'll see that there's a texture that's similar to what is used in the sewers. However, once you load the next area, you'll see that the texture here is completely different. You'll see that it's the fiberglass padding. Now, this may or may not be an indication of an old version of what this area was supposed to look like. That's entirely speculative, but the start of the game shows you something that's a little more concrete. It's a pretty strong indication that this is what the hallway or facility was supposed to look like at one point and was later changed. So, like I said, right at the start of the game, right as Barney is walking up to you to let you off the tram, if you were to take the camera inside of this hallway here, you can see an old version of how it was supposed to look. And since this is all a scripted scene, we can leave the camera inside of here and watch as the area completely changes in textures as the next area is loaded. A quick little last minute addition here. There's also a scene towards the end of the game where you have to face off against snipers. And if you take the camera past the netting, where the sniper is shooting you from, you could see that the sniper, quote unquote, is probably the lowest poly thing I've ever seen on Boundary Break. It's basically a cardboard cutout with a cement texture that's in the shape of a human body. Brilliant. Now let's talk about the man on the forklift. Who is this guy and what does he look like? Well, since the game never gives you a good opportunity to go straight up to him and talk to him, we'll have to escape the boundaries to get a better look. And it turns out this guy does have a name, as his name tag clearly says Gus. Gus over here is a low poly model, which is, uh, it's really nice to see an even lower poly model for a human character in a game that already has very low poly character models to begin with. And his lift is also not properly textured. This is not a problem because you never get a great close-up look at it, but if you look at the steering wheel here, you can see that part of the side of the machine seems to be overlaid on the steering wheel itself. And keeping inside the facility before the accident, we can look at these two scientists inside the bathroom stalls. Now, you never get to see inside the stalls while the scientists are in there. <laughs> and yeah, I do understand that it's not really a good idea to peek on people using the bathroom, but in this case, it's okay because for educational purposes, if you're a game developer, one of the big reasons why the stalls remain closed is because the scientists are using an animation cycle that is the same for when they're typing on the computer. And so obviously you don't want the player to see scientists typing into thin air while using the bathroom. But then again, I suppose you don't want the player to ever see someone using the bathroom, period. So there's that. So this was one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to cover Half-Life as an episode. I remember in my childhood, this scene in particular was really interesting to me. Gordon Freeman at one point pushes the object into the device and it causes a chain reaction, one that teleports Gordon Freeman to various areas. And to me, this is one of the most memorable moments in gaming. Being surrounded by weird aliens, getting on an alien planet for one point, it set off a lot of imagination in my brain. Being able to tell you guys how this all works is a huge honor of mine. As it turns out, all of these areas are in the same 
same loading zone as where you start off. They are just rooms in a giant map that are segmented off and your character Gordon Freeman is teleported from spot to spot. And you can see where they are in relation to where you begin. But not only that, the engine for Half-Life uses rooms to give you a special effect, whether it be a bright white light or an electrical effect that sparks black and green. It's all a separate area that Gordon Freeman gets teleported to. So like for example, this map here that's towards the end of the game, you might notice these several white cuboids outside the boundaries. Well, the reason why these exist is because in this map, there is a teleportation system. And every time that Gordon Freeman goes into one teleporter, there need to be a box made for that teleportation because each teleportation box will take you to a specific location. So they need to have that white effect for when he goes through the teleporter, but unfortunately they can't reuse the same box. And so that's why there's so many of them right here outside of this map. And that's not the only thing we can discuss as far as random cuboids go. There's lots that have to do with very specific things outside of teleportation and effects for you, the character. Like for example, if you peek inside of this one, you can see a light source inside of the cube. Now you might be asking yourself, why is there a cuboid with a light source inside of it? What purpose could that possibly serve? Well, this one's for a manta ray looking enemy that flies around the environment. And that manta ray is in fact using the light source from this cuboid. It is not using the light source from the map itself. It instead has a consistent light source that's being derived from this cuboid. And you'll notice cuboids in various areas of Half-Life. And yeah, we kind of jumped to the end of the game just now, but let's jump right back to the start and show you this cuboid right here. You can't see the light source, but thanks to the help of Marfi Black, I was able to find out why this cuboid is here. It's for the same reason as the one that I showed you that had a physical representation of what purpose it serves. For this one, it's supposed to be the constant light source for the tram. There's also this scene here with an elevator, and I just wanted to show it off real quick because it was a scene that was pretty prominent to me, and I always wondered if there was anything to it beyond what you get to see. Taking the camera down below, though, shows you that the scientists do turn into Gibbs, so, you know, you're not going to find them down here, but the elevator does clip through the map itself. It squeaks about halfway through, so if you kind of angle the camera in a really nice way, you can see the bottom of the elevator. So that's pretty cool. But also, something else I want to show you real quick is this right here with the sewer system. Again, if you take the camera completely outside of the environment, you're not going to see this, but if you kind of angle it in a special way, you can see a whole strip of water. Now, what is this strip of water doing down here? Well, again, after consulting with Marfi Black, he explained how it all works. And obviously the layer of water on the top is inside of the sewer. And so the water inside of the sewer also has a large flat plane, just like this. And what the developers do to make water work in Half-Life is that they create boxes or cubes that all behaves like water. So if you were able to get outside the boundaries, technically the space between the top layer and the bottom layer of water should be able to allow you to swim. Because although it's not textured on all sides, in truth, it's encapsulating a whole cube of it. Okay, now this is one of my favorite parts of this episode. You might remember this part here where the scientist comes out of the garbage dump. Totally played up for comedic effect, I love it, but here's the thing. Pulling that off is not as easy as you would think. The developers had to go through a little bit of trickery in order to manage this. And so what they did was, first of all, they put in a layer of water to allow a water sound effect as he goes in and out of the trash bin. But second of all, he's standing on top of a lift. I guess it was more difficult to have the scientist have a program attached to him that would allow him to move up and down on his own. So what had to be done was they used a trigger system that moves a lift underneath his feet up and down. Yeah, I love video games. Also, one thing that we haven't discussed up to this point is that there is a third person model for Gordon Freeman. I know that a lot of you may have not ever noticed this model before, so I do want to give you a nice look at it. Apparently, he has a ponytail in the back and he doesn't have his signature glasses. But also, when you switch back to first person, you can see what his first person model looks like from another angle. In some cases, it's pretty interesting. Like, you'll see his left hand on certain weapons that he doesn't use it for. And for his pistol, you can see that there's a clip for his gun stored off to the side. Now, that ends up being used in animation when he reloads his gun, but when he's not reloading his gun, it's stored there at all times. Now here was the craziest part of this whole episode. Granted, I never do any research ahead of time when I do these things because I kind of want to be surprised and I'll tell you something, this was one big surprise. Right after this lift here, if you were to take the camera down below, you might notice something off in the distance. It's a little fleshy colored. Taking the camera all the way over there shows you a cube that is plastered with Gabe Newell's face, which is really, really interesting. 
in this version of Half-Life, I don't believe there's any other room that uses this texture. And thanks to Murphy Black, I can tell you that there is a purpose to this room. This room is used to house a hound eye, and then that hound eye is later teleported into the player field. All right, I know, I, I kind of was glossing over the fact that we were in a room with Gabe Newell's face. I do apologize, but we got to move on. And, you know, part of what is so interesting about that fact is that the engine for Half-Life doesn't need to have enemies stored out of bounds in order to be called in later. At some point during development, the developers allowed themselves to just spawn in enemies without storing them anywhere. But in certain cases, like this one here, you can see an enemy being stored out of bounds. And when the prerequisites are met, you can see the enemy move out into the stage. But here's an example of an enemy that has not moved out into the stage just yet. Also, you might notice a very funny texture for that box. Not as funny as Gabe Newell's face, but it's still pretty funny. It's the Half-Life logo there. For you folks that have watched this show before, this is not a default texture. I managed to verify that through Murphy Black. This is a texture that is intentionally put into the game. Now, it's not intentionally meant to be seen by the player, but the developers have to choose this texture to be in the game. And you can find another example of this in the silo where the rocket is held. These are doors and pathways that can be opened up to the player when you're in the correct spot, but because you're in a completely different loaded map, these hallways are not used. So to cover up the hallway and not expose the void, the developers have placed this texture here instead. And speaking of rockets and silos, how about that scene in the game where the rocket does get ignited and starts leaving the base? There's something really interesting going on here. So if you get outside of this box that the developers have put in place, you can start to see things that are hidden or masked, despite the fact that it's an outdoors area. And so across from Gordon Freeman, there's a large, large box. And above where the rocket is, is another large box. Now here's how this works. And again, not my explanation. This is Murphy Blacks. But the one that's off in the distance stores the rocket. It doesn't start off inside the silo. It starts off here. And then it's later teleported to where it leaves the base. Now what's the other box for, you might ask? It could be your assumption that that's where it gets stored after it leaves the base. But that's not technically true. This box is here in place because there are pointers, little programs that tells the rocket to move up. And in fact, that's not the only example of this. For the coolant system, you have the water level rise at three different occasions. And it uses this system as well of using core points to guide the water level. Now what's cool is that if we take the camera below the map here, the first core point for the water is outside of the map. And so in order to store that core point, that piece of programming, a little dev cube has to be stored underneath as well. And then inside that dev cube is what tells the water to stay there. And then inside the map, there are two other core points that are completely invisible. But with this image that was provided to me, I could show you what they would look like and where they would be. And now let's explore some depths to see something that we were never meant to see. Like for example, the tentacles here. This was always a standout moment for me. And I always wanted to know what it looked like on the other end of these tentacles. Well, the tentacles do have a lot of geometry. It goes pretty far deep, but unfortunately, once you get to the very end of the tentacles, it's not even modeled. And so likely what most of you expected, the tentacles just sort of have a tentacle and that's it, no base. On top of that though, there is this pool of water here. Now this is really cool. And I say it's really cool because this is one thing that Murphy Black couldn't explain. Go all the way down this body of water. And once you get to the bottom, it looks like that's it. This is as far as the player can certainly go. But if you no clip through the bottom of this bottom, there is a second bottom. And for some reason, this second bottom has a whole bunch of red bars or red beams. But these red beams don't have any functionality attached to them. And so to find out what purpose they serve is a mystery because these red beams aren't used anywhere else in the game either. Oh, now this is pretty cool. So you see these barrels that are going through this toxic waste? What I particularly love about it is that it's going through a full loop. Rather than spawn and despawn these barrels, the barrels travel through a repeating path. And once again, because all the objects in Half-Life need to be inside the map, this means that the barrels not only come out one end and then travel all the way back to it once more, but there needs to be an environment made for that to happen as well. And then right here is a Bradley tank. Surprisingly, there's multiple tanks in this game, but it's important to specify that this one's the Bradley tank because of those many different types of tanks, there are interiors to some, but the Bradley tank never opens. And yet when you take the camera inside of the Bradley tank, you can see an unused interior. 
one with benches on the inside. Now, there is a tank that's used later on in the game that opens up that looks very similar, but as you can see, the interior is completely different. In fact, so different, this one doesn't even have benches on it. And here we are at the end of the game with G-Man. Now, I wanted to show you something really cool here, and it's something that we've already explained once before in this episode. But you see this giant empty room here? Doesn't look very familiar, does it? It seems to have a long halo of blue lights. Now, this room seems to be properly textured, so it would be very hard to imagine that this isn't just an unused room. But in truth, this room is used. You know those halos that you first see when you get engaged with the G-Man? Ones that are around the platform. Those rings have their own special light, and that light is being used from this room. Wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ashes. The first thing that I want to look at is, of course, what happens at the very start of the game. You see G-Man basically introducing himself to Gordon Freeman. You kind of saw him in my episode's intro, but you didn't see the stuff that was going on through his body. And through his body, you can see a background image of other areas of the game. Like, for example, the chamber that started all the events of Half-Life in general, as well as some things that you're going to see at the end of Half-Life 2. If you take yourselves right outside of the map at the very start of the game, you're going to find some things that you weren't meant to see almost immediately. In fact, I can list off at least three things here that are worth noting. Here you can see that low poly chamber that we were talking about, and you can tell that it was specifically designed to look just like it did in the original game. But that's not the only thing you can see. You can also find the prison chambers that can be found at the end of the game. There are dedicated rooms that are completely outside the map that allows us to use those objects in that one tiny scene. Gotta give credit to Valve for showing a ton of commitment to the Half-Life franchise here. And there are two other things here that are pretty interesting. One of which is this long black box, which I'm pretty convinced now is what was used to store the G-Man and the particle effects that was used in the intro. Now without definitive proof, I could still always be wrong here, but I back myself up with what we're gonna see at the very end of this episode. But for now, all you can really see inside of this black box is this one texture. And the developers at Valve are hardly ones to ever waste something, at least in this particular game. So since it's purpose isn't immediately obvious, we can connect the dots. And that other thing I wanted to show you guys is something that we're going to be taking a lot of focus on in this particular episode. And that is the use of projecting a character onto a screen in the game world, while at the same time having an actual room to store these characters in. Like for example here, you can see the model at play, and then when the signal cuts out, the texture is thrown in front of the face, as well as a funny animation that the player's not meant to see. Stay or... Passing through on your way to parts unknown, welcome to City 17. It's safer here. I can pretty much figure out why a lot of people wanted me to cover Half-Life 2 as an episode. There's a ton of twists and turns that you're not allowed to go to as the player. Like for example, right here at the very beginning of the game, there's a gate that's closed off to you. The door doesn't open and the player's only allowed to see that there's actually another hallway that they can't reach. Well, the sad truth is that a lot of these twists and turns that you're not able to reach as the player oftentimes meets a very quick end. And there is something to be said about all this. I find it really impressive that the lighting used in this game is used very effectively to make the world seem a lot larger than it is, while at the same time saving a lot on resources. Like here, if we turn on the Fulbright, we can see that this inaccessible hallway is really, really tiny. And I can confirm that the largest sum of all these types of spaces are exactly the same way, but I'll still remember to show one or two more examples before the episode's over. Now we're going to talk about how skyboxes work in Valve games. See, when I did my Portal 2 episode, I didn't specifically call it a skybox, and that upset a lot of very passionate Valve fans. Big reason for this is that there's developer commentaries for almost every recent Valve game, and you can learn a lot through them. So when I failed to call their version of a skybox a skybox, I was called out. But to be fair, the way that Valve handles skyboxes is incredibly unusual. See, what they do is that they have a model of the background stored somewhere in the area and then the version of the skybox that you see in the game is projected 
So in a sense, this is not actually where the skybox is. Instead, the skybox tends to be like way off in the distance down below wherever you are in Half-Life 2. Triggers are used in almost every single modern 3D game. It's a must-have game development feature in order to do a show like Sequence Break, but Valve games have a very special tree. In the console commands, you can activate a physical representation of where the triggers are. Like for example here, this guard will leave you alone unless you step over that trigger. That tells the game to allow the guard to pull out his weapon and start hitting you. The beginning of Half-Life 2 especially gives you a lot of little peeks into the window of the society that you are walking through. However, you're usually stopped by a guard or a locked door, and you don't really get a good look at what's going on. This one scene especially is kind of interesting. The scene implies that the guards go in there and start beating up this guy for whatever reason. But if we were to take the camera inside of this apartment, in truth, what's really happening here is the furniture is just being flown around almost like it was done by a ghost, and the resident that lives in this apartment happens to already be dead on the ground before the guards even show up. But from the perspective of the player, what little you are allowed to see combined with the sound effects paints the intended picture in your head for you. So in this scene, I have two things to show you. The first is that you can see these monitors here inside this room. But once again, this is something that's projected from something outside of the area. And in this particular case, it's right behind it. It's really cool. You can actually see that the image just scrolls across really slowly, which gives the effect on the screens like a camera is panning a certain direction. And even further than that, we can find one of the G-Man sightings. Now, I'm not going to show you all the G-Man sightings. It's going to get kind of repetitive kind of fast, but I'm going to show you a couple here and there. And the reason why it gets really repetitive is because I'm sure a lot of you want to know where the G-Man goes whenever you do spot him. Unfortunately, this is one example that will represent all of them, in which the G-Man just simply disappears the second that he's off screen. And now let's turn our attention away to a viewer request. At any time, you can follow me on Twitter and give me any kind of request that you want to see in the next episode. Now, this particular week, I can't get to every single viewer request because most of them have the same result as the G-Man itself. But this one was pretty popular, and they wanted to know what happens to the head crab after it goes through the vent. Well, sorry to say, the second that it's out of the player's view in a normal sequence, the head crab Lamar disappears. From me. Here, my pet. Hop up. No, not up there! No, no! Careful, Lamar! Those are quite fragile! Oh, fine! In this scene, Barney comes out of a door on a raised ledge and gives Gordon the signature crowbar. But if you take the camera into a bird's eye view, you can actually see that the crowbar isn't there. It's only loaded into the scene when it's necessary. And the door that Barney came from? Well, it only houses a very small closet space, which is actually kind of funny because in this building in particular, there's an unused area that's completely unused by the player. Although not fully complete, this area does have its own floor and doors, and the floor tiles are very unique to themselves. Here's another example of how the developers were so effective with lighting. Here you can see these sewer tunnels that seem to go off into the distance to the point where it just turns into complete darkness. Now if I hadn't forced you to think about this critically, you may have just assumed that this tunnel actually goes in pretty deep and you'd want to see how far it actually goes. However, when you make everything in this game bright, you can actually see that these tunnels end pretty quickly, and that the end of these tunnels are actually just two brick wall textures. Here in this tunnel, we got an unusual enemy placement. If you look up, you can see that there's grating that leads out into the outside world. But one thing you can't see is this armored guard that you're not even able to engage with until later in the game. I haven't got a clue what he's doing here. I mean, he's not even supposed to attack Gordon. There's no triggers for it. Next up is another viewer request, and it's a really simple one. The viewer wanted to know if there really is a face underneath the head crab, specifically when the head crab is actually on the face. Now, if you were to blow these guys away with a shotgun, you can reveal the face naturally in game. But this person just wanted to verify whether or not the face is there at all times, and as it turns out, it is. Also, let's take a look at what Gordon Freeman looks like in the third person. And for some reason, he's not textured properly in Half-Life 2. Instead, it's a stand-in model with what looks like a concrete texture. This third person mode is completely underdeveloped. In fact, other things that interact with Gordon Freeman don't seem to affect the model in any way. Like, for example, here with this boat, he just disappears the second he goes inside.
Speaking of boats, let's do a zoom out of one of the winding areas that the boat has to travel through in this particular chapter of the game. Now, the entire canal here is not represented. As you know, there's lots of loading segments during this one part of the game. But with that said, it's pretty amazing how huge this part of the game is when you consider the fact that this is only like one sixth of the entire area. Now, originally, I was just going to use this segment as another example of how they make areas look larger than they actually are. But instead, we got something much better. We actually have ourselves a low poly peach moment. And by that, I mean, if we zoom the camera in on this guy's face, we can see that because he was so far off in the background, the developers knew that they could just make his face with a lower poly count and lower texture resolution to save on resources. Not too common in this game. So I was really surprised to see this guy break the norm. Now here's a zoom out of the training area where you get the gravity gun. Like with anything that's displayed on a screen in Half-Life 2, you can actually find it somewhere in the adjacent area. And this part with Eli is no different. But one of the cool things about this scene specifically is how when the monitor cuts out, there's actually a physical box that displays in front of the camera that's pointing at Eli. Here's a uncommon sighting of the G-Man. A lot of people tend to miss this one because you have to go all the way to the end of this train and then crouch in order to catch a small glimpse of him. And I just wanted to take this moment to show you physical proof of how the G-Man just simply disappears the moment he's off screen. Here's another instance of a character that is off screen so that they can be recorded in a box and displayed on a monitor. Although I gotta say, it's kind of strange that they actually have real textures for these boxes. I would just imagine it'd be completely black or just have a placeholder texture. This right here is a clear cut case of how a trigger works. As you probably just noticed a second ago, after I moved a certain amount of distance, these leeches start attacking Gordon Freeman. However, if we turn on the physical representation of triggers, you can literally see the line in which you can swim and you can get eaten alive. So here's two more examples of characters being broadcasted onto a monitor screen. I just find this way too fascinating. For example, here you can see the exact spot where the prisoners and Eli are being held, as well as the end transmission graphic that gets displayed on the screen afterwards. And just after that, we can see where Mossman was speaking with Wallace Breen. This room in particular is really strange. It's very elongated for seemingly no reason, and you can also kill Wallace Breen. Okie doke. But even stranger than that, you can see a picture of Wallace Breen facing Mossman. Of course, the player would never be able to see that whatsoever, so there's no point in having that picture there, especially if it's not broadcasting the actual face of Wallace. So I thought this was kind of unusual, but hey, I guess the voice has to come from somewhere, right? Even though there is no monitor capture of Dr. Kleiner, Dr. Kleiner has to be loaded into the game in order to speak. So if we take the camera over to here, we could see that Wait a second, they do have a placeholder texture? How come they didn't use it this whole time? How come this is the only time they have the placeholder texture? Well, this is a strange one. But what you can see here is it says wall with 128 over 128. The numbers here represent the height and width of the pixels. Here's a part where there's an inaccessible area of the game. The gate is normally locked and behind that is just a concrete wall where the door is supposed to be. But if we take the camera through that concrete wall, we can actually see there's an unused hallway that cannot be reached by the player. Here's another zoom out of the city under siege. Fulbright is turned on this time so you can see all the details of this area. Here's the last character monitor room that we're going to be looking at in this episode. This one's for a very mysterious character that later gets introduced in the episodes of Half-Life 2, though you might find this little tidbit kind of fun. The character model for this creature in Half-Life 2 is actually different in detail from the one that is used in the episodes. 
And at the end of Half-Life 2, you meet the G-Man himself one more time and he teases you with cryptic wording that leads you into episode 1 and 2, as well as... Well, never mind. Point is, we found the room where this event takes place. In here, we can find the triggers that are used, as well as the particle effects that are used during this final scene. And lastly, we find this hallway that's really long, and it actually belongs to the door that G-Man steps through before he famously says, This is where I get off. You know how these cubes here can keep respawning so long as you destroy the cube in the first place and then push a button to spawn another one? Well, there's always a hanging cube outside the boundaries waiting to be dropped in by the game's programming. And like I said, it was very difficult to find in the first place, but just edging yourself very slightly allows you to see it. But look, that isn't to say that there isn't going to be anything to find outside the boundaries simply because there's a void now placed in the game. Far from it, in fact. Anytime there's an energy pellet in the game, the object used to spawn those energy pellets is always stored outside the boundaries. And it typically looks like these red dots here. I mean, maybe many of you already know this, and maybe a couple of you are asking yourselves right now, how does he even know that that spawns the energy pellet? All the maps and all the functions outside the maps, everything. These are assets that are placed in the hands of the players. There are tools made by Valve that are fully accessible to the fans. And so while working on this episode, I would reach out to some people that are very familiar with the software and ask them exactly what's going on. And in fact, this second red dot here shouldn't even be here. It's a leftover asset because on this particular map, there's only one energy pellet and there's supposed to be one red dot for every one energy pellet, making this one completely unused. And it should be stated that these red dots are not exclusive to the energy pellets either. Sometimes while moving around in the void, you can accidentally trigger an inbounds area despite the fact that there are no walls. You know that you've triggered an inbounds area because all of a sudden the refresh on the void is gone. And if you're lucky enough to accidentally stumble into one of these, you might find something. And in this case, we found another aperture cube. When asked what this aperture cube was for, the answer was as simple as just another object used to help spawn in energy pellets. A quick little editor's note, I'm going to leave in everything that I said before because it's part of the journey of discovery. But I reached out to someone who's a little more familiar with Source, and he was saying that what you're looking at is still inbounds, and you're just looking at a no-draw texture. Here's what a no-draw texture looks like in the map editor. And he was saying that entities in Source can't be outside the level, and so everything gets housed inside these bubbles known as no-draw. And what you end up looking at is the no-draw, and according to the Source, which is Quentin Svensky, the void is behind that no-draw. Okay, let's take a little bit of a break from the technical side of things so that we can just talk about something that's a little easier on the brain. I think a lot of people want to know about the ending of the game and there's three key scenes that are worth exploring and for right now, let's just focus on one, which is the outdoor area. As part of the ending sequence of the game, your character is laying down on the ground and you get a glimpse of sweet, sweet freedom. But unfortunately, you're then dragged by probably a claw and you are placed back in the facility. Now that glimpse of the outside area is by no means an exaggeration, it's pretty much just a glimpse. But this entire area is rendered in real time, which means it exists. And where does it exist? Well, in the last area of the game, the map shares all of these areas together in one. And so taking yourself outside the boundaries and exploring over in this direction can show you the outdoor area, which means you can now get a better look at this skybox here. Almost looks like something out of Kankamangas Highway in New Hampshire. And the platform itself shows you a much better look at the security booth. Now, outside of that, you would think there wouldn't be that much to see. You got the robotic remains here, of course. That's what you're supposed to see. But there are two things here that you're not allowed to see. One of which being a box of beans, which is clearly the texture for the can of beans placed over a box of ammunition instead, as well as a radio. Seems kind of random, doesn't it? Well, it's not as random as you might think. The box of beans does have a function attached to it. What this little guy is responsible for is that animation that you see as you're being dragged away by the claw. I should note the fact as well that I was able to manipulate the camera in a way to see behind me, and uh, you can see that there is no physical claw dragging you. It's simply an animation. Now, as for the radio, uh, this one gets a little bit weird. If you were to inject a standard weapon into the game and aim it down at the radio, you'd see that the radio bleeds. Now, 
why does it bleed? I can tell you right now, all the other radios don't do that, and nor should they. But this one does because it's assigned as an NPC. And what this little guy does is it creates all the sound effects used during the ending cutscene. And so lo and behold, this whole time you had a generic actor to your immediate right, feeding you all those wonderful bits of the game's presentation. <laughs> and now that we have all that out of the way, let's do a zoom out of this area to give you just a look at the scope of how much of this area you don't get to see. A lot of people are asking me what happens to the companion cube after you drop it into the chute. Also a somewhat related question that we'll get to in a second. They also want to know what happens when you take a cube or the companion cube through to the next floor. And to answer that, we need to talk about triggers. And the wonderful thing about triggers, at least in a Valve game, is that you can activate physical representation of triggers. And so now that we have the triggers activated, we can see all sorts of funny things. Those steps that are supposed to break off as you step on them, guess what? They got trigger boxes. That little bit of dialogue you hear as you pass through that doorway, the experiment is nearing its conclusion. Trigger box and the companion cube. Drop the companion cube into the chute. Here's a trigger to set off the dialogue as well as open the door for you. And then here's the other trigger to remove the cube from the map, which also means there's a trigger to get rid of these objects as you're trying to head towards the elevator. And so to answer the question, what would happen if you took a cube onto an elevator, we got to remove that trigger. So we got the trigger removed and we have the cube on the elevator. I got to say to my surprise, taking the cube with you and activating this trigger allows you to take the cube into the next map. There isn't much to say about what you can do with this cube in the new map other than of course doing some sequence breaking so you can use your imagination there. There's also a trigger as you're going up the elevator shaft and if you fail to activate this trigger you will not find the next floor at the top of this elevator because the next map hasn't loaded. This is the trigger for the next map. That's why the game loads. Another popular viewer request which you can always follow me on Twitter if you ever want to leave one is how do the portals work? Now I make no bones about it if you want to really break this down on a mechanical level there are videos available out there that can teach you every technical nuance behind it. But to break it down in the most basic terms possible, what you see is a camera pointed from the opposite portal and viewed through the lens of the portal you placed. And when you start to walk through the portal, at a certain point your character is then warped from one position on the map to another. In fact, if we made the camera third person and we showed the character model slowly moving through this portal, you can see the exact moment in which the character model warps from one position to another. And oh my goodness, going through the portal with Shell in third person is absolutely terrifying. If you move around and manipulate yourself in certain ways, uh, Shell's eyes don't even know what to do with themselves anymore. You can get some really creepy stares. You can also get her to go cross-eyed. Playing portal in third person should be outlawed. All right, let's talk about areas that can't be seen by the player. For example, this one right here, there is this deceptive little scene where you're trying to walk towards the other end of this hallway, and then all of a sudden all the pistons start activating and you can't get to that other side and you get trapped down below. My question is, what is on that other side then since you're not allowed to get there? Well, with the exception of a couple of reused assets, there isn't much to see outside of the unrefreshed void. How about these crevices up here that expose some light? Going past the boundaries up here can show you that there is a shared room between these two different platforms. However, outside of that, there isn't too much to see. And then how about all these observation rooms? What's going on inside there? Well, I checked every single one and there isn't too much to see here. Most of them just have monitors that you were able to see at later stages of the game, as well as the occasional desk and chair. And after you beat the game, there's a unique title screen and I wanted to show you what that looks like in full. Poking the camera around can show you the companion cube off to the right, although that is already a secret that is supposed to be shown to the player. If you wait a full minute on the title screen, the camera will pan over to look at it, but one of the things that it doesn't do is show you the door that's off to the left here, or the wall that's completely behind you. For some reason, this is a completely encapsulated room. And then there's the board room here. Now this is a room that cannot be accessed by the player by normal means, so let's poke around inside and see what we can find. Now there's a lot of clipboards in here, and most of these I notice are used throughout the entire game. The only one that I couldn't seem to find myself, you know, it, it could be out there somewhere and I just happened to miss it, but I still think it's a responsibility of mine to show you what I couldn't find at least. It's a clipboard that talks about the Mark V hazardous environment suit, which is a reference to the suit that is used in Half-Life 2 and it becomes pretty apparent why you don't have access to this room. The biggest reason being that if you move the projector, it still projects the images on the screen and the developers didn't do anything to account for when you shift or move the projector. 
Also, the theater projector reads Ikey Theater Projector, as well as a serial number underneath. This is a real theater projector. Here's an image of one right here. This is the X-T5 version, and as you can see, it's incredibly similar. You know, I'd be very curious to see if Valve got the copyright to use this image in their game. Something similar happened in the Silent Hill 2 episode where the Levi's jeans logo was on the button of someone's pants, and, uh, and I'm pretty sure you can't do that. And then for the 17th test room, there's an area that is not meant to be out of bounds. This is an area that is used when you switch to the advanced maps after completing the game. But when loading regular maps, these aren't supposed to be here. So for this to be floating out of bounds is something left behind by the developer. And once again, you can see here that it's so segmented off that if you look over into the areas where there should be doors or at least more of a hallway, you can see once again the unrefreshed void. Now to jump back into what we were talking about towards the beginning of the episode, we got more of the ending environments. You might remember this tunnel here where Shell gets dragged through and it's all in first person and there's nice sound effects and everything. We talked about it. The radio causes those sound effects and everything. It's very interesting stuff, but I combed every inch of this thing. There wasn't anything that was particularly interesting. There was a couple of doors and warning signs, but that's typical stuff that you see throughout your entire adventure in Portal. No, but what I'm going to show you is what it looks like going through this tunnel cutscene in third person. Because who doesn't love their immersion broken by the idea of the main protagonist constantly banging her head through all the pipes and girders. And of course, this tunnel takes you down to the very last thing you see before the staff roll. In its original context, it's kind of creepy. It certainly doesn't feel like a happy ending now, does it? But if we were to, say, illuminate this room and effectively take away its moody lighting and also walk around in this area freely it's not as intimidating it's very clear that this area is basically a storage room with nothing else really going for it you can interact with the companion cube as per usual but you cannot interact with the cake but with that aside let's just spin the camera around one of these maps because like i said despite some of the objects being called out most of the map and typically all of the map is rendered all at once which makes the view very interesting Hey, what's up, chubby nuts? All right, I'm gonna be honest with you here. I thought I was gonna be doing this intro, but the grammar is just freaking terrible. So you know what? I'm just gonna explain it to you right here. So I think this is just a show where the guy can take the camera basically anywhere. But let's be honest with ourselves, right? It's, it's just no clip, all right? It's no clip. Don't let this con man fool you. It's totally no clip. However, that animated intro from Michael Chin, 1994, that was some beautiful stuff. Oh, man, it was really good. I mean, nah, it wasn't Valve good, you know, but what am I even saying here? This is one man we're talking about. Okay, okay, look, I, I just gotta calm down. I gotta calm down. What am I even still doing here? Enjoy the show, people. Or don't, I don't care. There's a ton of great videos called the Meet The Series, where you got to meet all the classes of Team Fortress 2, and three of the project files used to make those animations were released to the public, that being Heavy, Engineer, and Soldier. And so let's start off with the Heavy. I am Heavy Weapons Guy. Right off the bat, you're gonna see something really cool here. I can show you the exact frame in which the regular cardboard box is replaced with a busted one. And before the box gets busted, the regular box flips through the floor to look like it's initially crushing. And when that box is crushed, it's replaced with a unique model. One that has a little feature to it that's never seen by the viewer. As from this angle, you can see a busted seam on the box that has ammo spilling out. Something that's never shown in the published video. Also, this room that you're seeing here is shared with the same map as the outdoor scenes of this video, which when the camera cuts away to heavy outside shooting at everybody, you'll notice that we have to move the camera outside of this room to get there. And by far the goofiest thing that's apparently in the published version of this video, but it's just really hard to notice, is that this scout over here in the foxhole has his hat inside of his shoulder, and he has a really goofy expression. And a quick explanation for why this is, is that there's two different models for Team Fortress 2, which is a cinematic model and a player model. Now obviously the model being used here is a player model as it functions like an AI, however it inherited the facial controls of the cinematic model, which doesn't translate well and gives you this really goofy Simpsons look. 
So Team Fortress 2 is a very rare example of where the developers are encouraging players to boundary break essentially, or to no clip if you're splitting hairs. And so the game is filled to the brim with easter eggs and a lot of it's heavily documented, but that's not going to stop me from sharing them here in this episode. Like over in the map CP Vanguard, there are vaults on both the red and blue sides. If you were to take the camera through this vault that cannot be opened by the player, you can see what the loot is. Which, sorry to disappoint you treasure hunters out there, is just a lonely banana. So in the Half-Life 2 episode of Boundary Break, as well as the Portal 2 episode of Boundary Break, I was starting to dip my toe in a very uncommon practice in video games, which is making a skybox off screen and projecting it around the maps. So now that I understand that this is a common practice in Valve games, as well as a couple of other companies, we could do something pretty fun here for a multiplayer game. What we got here is the animator Michael Chin 1994 moving his character into the skybox of the Egypt map. And when that happens, well, like I said, everything gets projected, including the character. So what we're doing here is we're showing you what it looks like when Michael Chin is hanging out in the skybox while we hang out in the map itself looking at the skybox. And as you can see, Michael Chin is terrifyingly huge. But you know what? We're not even done with the Egypt map just yet. How about that skybox, right? I don't think we're done talking about it. Because if you look at the clouds against the void instead of the blue sky, that camouflage color is no longer there. And you can see a little bit of a flub on the map developer's part, as there's a transparent blue box around the cloud. And you can also see eraser marks made around the cloud. And this is something that's in the official roster of maps for Team Fortress 2. So you could boot up your own game and check it out for yourself right now. So I looked inside of all the character models and I will tell you there was not really much to find with pretty much all of them. That is to say except for Demo Man. I was very surprised to find out that the Demo Man model has an eyeball underneath the eye patch. Now not a standard eyeball by any means, instead it's a completely black eye. And in a model viewer, it just looks straight black with no texture whatsoever. It's because it is. But in the game, there's more going on with it because there's effects added to the eyeball just like anybody's eye. So what you're seeing here is some reflective shine. And now let's do a zoom out of the map upward, which is a pretty popular Team Fortress 2 map. Okay, there's like 5 million things going on with this engineer video, but I'm going to try to break down some of the more interesting stuff. Like for example here, when you see this gunshot right at the start of the video, you'll see that it spawns a blue engineer who shot the gun. Which means that in the published video that you saw that was released by Valve, there is in fact a blue engineer off screen here. And also you may notice the sniper walking in the background of the official video. Well anyways, to pull that off they had to do a little bit of perspective trickery. Because what you're going to see here, which is incredibly awesome, is in truth the sniper is just walking through the air in order to look like he's walking down a hill in the published video. In fact, the same can be said for all the character models at the end of this video as well, as they are also walking in midair to fool your perspective. And what ends up happening to the hand that he kicks at the end of the video is it's stuck in midair just off camera for a good while before it changes scenes. And also, this area is a unique map made just for this Source Filmmaker video. And so if we were to pan the camera back a little bit, you'd be surprised how much environment is not seen by the player, despite its one purpose to Valve. Okay, let's get back into those easter eggs. So one map that has two easter eggs in it is the Foundry. The first one can be found near a blue capture point inside of a garage. And to the untrained eye, it would look like nothing's going on inside of this garage aside from the fact that the player can't access it. However, if you notice, those planks are covering up certain letters. And if you read what's in between those two planks backwards, you'll see that it spells out robot. And inside the red team space, you'll see a red soldier guarding a door. If we were to take the camera past that soldier and inside that door, there's a room that's fully modeled with Scout and Heavy, looking at difficult to make out pictures of the robots. Which a very similar easter egg is also found in the map Doomsday, but instead it's on the blue side. And past the soldier is a spy that looks a little bit defeated. Also has a map showing three areas that would later become maps for Man vs. Machine. And also, fun little note, the spy cigarette is still attached to the model and it's clipping through his arm. But let's round this all off by going back to Foundry and doing a zoom out because this map is a really good looking map from far away. And 
hey, you know what? We talked about man versus machine earlier, so why don't we talk about that? The first thing I want to take a look at is this vehicle over here that houses all the robots. Now, if you take the camera inside, you might notice there's a bunch of cubes that make up some of the aesthetic of it. However, there's one cube that's never seen by the player, and it should also be noted that even if you could get at the right angle to see where it's supposed to be, you'd never be able to see it because it's only inside the vehicle. It's this blue cube over here. And normally when we see cubes on this show, it's supposed to represent a function. What that function could be is sometimes hard to say, but in this case, I'm almost certain it was for aesthetic reasons. However, funny that I should mention cubes on this map because there is a cube that is underneath the map that is meant for just that. It's meant to call in some sort of function. I'm sitting here waiting to see what it would do, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to show you what it does. Unlike the box used in the Harvest event map where it's used to spawn ghosts, but the developers decided to be a little bit cheeky with this spawn box and even furnished it up to look like a break room. The cool thing about Team Fortress 2 is that yes, all the maps that you get are official at a certain point. However, some of the maps that become mainstays were created by users. Like over here in the map Freight, there is a secret bounty room that has the artist's initials on the ceiling. And that same map designer managed to also have another map made. And so naturally you can assume that if you take the camera through some part of this map, you will once again find his initials. <laughs> So let's start talking about aliens. And really quick, there is another Easter egg in this map. There is a secret room inside of the silo that is dedicated to the creator of this map, complete with emblems and URLs and everything else. But what I find more interesting is the map itself. One of the things that can happen while you're on this stage is that you get abducted by aliens and then your character is inside of a spaceship. So there's a lot of questions that need to get asked there. Where is the spaceship room? Is it inside the spaceship itself? Well, no it's not. There is a static room where the characters get teleported to. And as for the spaceships themselves, where are they? Well, you can find a whole lot of spaceships on the corner of a map here and you'll see that most of them get used at a certain point. But it is just fun to note that the creator used more than one spaceship and just gave them very specific functions. And in the map, water gate. Oh boy, here we go. You'll notice that the spaceship starts in the skybox. And if we take a look at the mothership that they spawn in, you can see a bunch of spaceships being stored in here waiting to be used. Now we already learned earlier that the skybox is merely a projection when you're using it in the map. So how is it that a spaceship can start in a skybox and then somehow immediately transition into the main map? Well, the way that they make this work is that the spaceship from the skybox eventually lands in the ocean and then it swaps out with a map version of the spaceship and then that version of the spaceship comes out of the water. And we're not even done here yet. There's also some Easter eggs to find. Like over here behind the box, there's an aperture robot from the Portal franchise. And on the blue team side behind the alleyway, there's another Easter egg alluding to the Man vs. Machine update. And seriously, I should've just called this episode off camera secrets Watergate because there's so much to talk about here. The last thing we're going to mention here is an unused asset. Way off in the distance there's a long strip that looks like a dev texture as it's mostly white with a box pattern. Hey here we go a viewer request. As always, if you want to stay on top of what the next game is going to be, as well as drop a suggestion for what you want to see in that episode, you can of course follow me on Twitter at Boundary Break. But yeah, as far as what you can find inside of this training area, not much. I get it, there's very limited space that you can walk around in this area and it looks like there's a lot to see, but as you can see in this footage right here, the second you step into those areas that look like it keeps going on, you'll find out that there's, there's really not much left. Next Easter egg that we got is in the map Snowplow. So in this map there's a locked door with a window that shows you inside of a room with three doors. If you were to take the camera through that window and of course go through those doors, you're gonna find things behind them. Like over on the left we have the Hat of Undeniable Wealth and Respect, and then as you go further in there's just a bunch of rubber duckies. In fact, rubber ducky seems to be a huge theme for this map. <laughs> They're littered all over the place, including the train itself, as the bomb rests on top of a pile of rubber duckies. And while we're over here, let's explain what you're looking at as far as what the train is doing before the match starts. Inside of the starting area, there are two layers of black textures that are supposed to hide the train, and the train itself clips through both. Why there's two, I don't know, but the reason why there would be one to begin with is so that if the player was to look inside, it would look like it's just a long, dark tunnel with seemingly no end. But of course, from this angle, you can see that there is.
Another great Easter egg is in the map warehouse, where if you walk around to a certain part of the map, you can see a candle through a crack in a window that's boarded up. And so if we no clip into that room, we can see that there's a lot more furnishing to this area than you would think, with a lot of mystical properties that use the Halloween event assets. Next up is one of the newer maps, Banana Bay. And I love what they do with the train here, because in order for this object to go from one end of the map to the complete opposite, they store it in the void for a little while before sending it back the other direction. And of course, we gotta talk about this insane Easter egg. Now there's two secret areas in this map that you can explore, but this one's far more interesting. So right at the spawn area, the blue side, you can see a little bit of green light peeking through a basement area. And if you take the camera down there, you can find a setup for a seance for Poopy Joe. And those of you who don't know the Poopy Joe, he was a monkey nut who died in an explosion shortly after the rocket took off. Good old Poopy Joe was owned by the Manco Company and had become a staple of Team Fortress 2 for quite a while. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight! Sun Tzu said that. And of course we gotta look at the footage from Meet the Soldier. Though there wasn't as much to look at like the other two, there is one unique thing about Meet the Soldier, and that is the heads on the fence. For most of the video, the heads on the fence are not the characters from Team Fortress 2. They are different versions of the soldier's head, just warped in different facial structures. The one on the far left being the most exaggerated. Also interesting to note, those heads don't have black eyes, they have eye holes. Possibly to further insinuate that the black eye for the demo man was intentional. And once it is at the end of the video, it is swapped out with a single object that connects all of the Team Fortress 2 members' heads together. And the only head that can be interacted with is the only head that ever moved in that short, which is the medics. <laughs> All right, so first I wanna talk about something that's just hidden in plain sight. Here in this kitchen, you have a box of cereal and you can actually make out the image. It's a deranged looking cow holding a spoon and the name of the cereal is called Choco Bites. Also in the bottom right hand corner, it says free spoon. But on the back of the box, there's something that's really special. It's a Team Fortress 2 Easter egg. One of the easiest images to make out is heavy over here over to the right and all across it says free inside one six inch figure. And it shows a picture of the Team Fortress 2 crowd and it says Team Fortress 2. Then in the blue circle it says fully posable, but the rest of it I couldn't possibly make out. At the very bottom though it says collect all 10. Which I gotta say was not something I was expecting to see. That's not the only Team Fortress 2 reference either. There are various parody cleaning products, like this one says Chlorine. And over here is a combination parody of the Scotch Bright brand as well as the Comet Cleaning Powder. But over in Left 4 Dead it's called Scout. Then over in this living room, there's a newspaper, and although it's very, very blurry, you can see that one of the people that's printed on the newspaper is Dr. Breen from Half-Life 2. Next up, we have the pilot here. We're doing a nice good close-up, and you can see that he's looking pretty rough. Not only is the textures all very low quality, but his face and his clothing and everything looks fatigued and infected. But what's really cool is that if you clip the camera through his sunglasses, you can actually see that he has eyes. And since the helicopter's constantly moving, and I had no way to freeze the gameplay, I downloaded the model from themodelsresource.com, and I removed his glasses that way so that you guys can get a nice good look at the pilot's fully modeled eyes. Next up is LOD models, and if you don't know what that is, quick explanation. Typically when models are much, much further away, developers are able to render more on screen thanks to having models that are far off in the distance that have less polygons. Think about the difference between a PlayStation 5 game and a Nintendo 64 game, and the LOD models tend to look more like the N64 games. With that said, all the main survivors have their own LOD models, and I'm here to show them off to you. It's kind of fascinating. We got Lewis here. And his mouth sort of smiles a bit more and his eyes look down. His, believe it or not, is probably one of the best looking LOD models out of the bunch. Get ready, because Zoe here just straight up looks possessed. She loses her eyes completely and honestly would probably fit right in with the zombie horde. Then we got Francis here and oh boy, this is where things start to get good. His eyes turn into lizard eyes and he loses his goatee. Something I was very surprised by. And of course there's Bill and he has the lizard eyes as well. Probably has it more profoundly than Francis. But the survivors aren't the only ones that get LOD models. The witch, for example, straight up loses her hair. 
What's really cool though is that the character has a texture on the back that represents the hair. And there's actually multiple stages of LOD, five in total for some characters like the witch. So I also wanted to show you an LOD model that's in between those two, where she does get to keep her hair, but it's much, much lower detailed. Speaking of the witch, I wanted to show you what her model looks like in game when you take the camera past the glowing red eyes. Yeah, the glowing redness is actually on a layer that's kind of sitting in front of the witch. And then we got the smoker and his is pretty great actually. The key difference that you'll see here is that the pussiness on his mutated part of his face loses the bubbles and just sort of conforms into a flat surface, but the texture quality is still pretty good. And obviously from a faraway distance, it would be really hard to notice this change. The tank though is not as fortunate. Reducing him to the lowest LOD setting basically caves his head in and stretches his eyes out. It's really freaking funny. And as for the zombies themselves, I couldn't seem to affect the LOD in the character viewer. But I did want to show you a couple things. One is that their eyes can look different from model to model, which is really fascinating. They don't have a homogenized look amongst them. So if you take the time to look at each of their faces, you can see that some of them have very different zombie eyes from one another. Some of them are completely blood shot, others are completely white, and some are red with red pupils. It's really wild. And like I said, even though they do have LOD models I've definitely seen in the game itself, sadly I couldn't get close to them, but I'm assuming they share the same LOD models as these environment zombies, but they also seem to have these hilarious low poly faces. Just taking the camera up to a few just so they can get a sample of what I'm talking about here. And then another thing I want to show you with models is one of the guns. On the side of the pistol, it has legible words on it. This one says Finleyville Armory. And then on the opposite side of that, it says Model 1911 AI Caliber 45. You can see that the bullet clip is in fact housed inside the gun. And now we'll do a zoom out of the first map of the first game, letting you see the entire area in one shot. And then I want to talk about this boat scene here. Obviously your characters get onto the boat and then there's this cutscene that triggers where you don't see your survivors anywhere. And the most likely answer for where they actually are is probably inside of this white cube that's just outside the map. Funny thing is, is that it would be in plain sight if it weren't for the skybox. And no, I'm not talking about the box in the sky at the moment. I'm talking about a video game's skybox or sky dome. Something that I would also love to explain to you guys. See, Left 4 Dead runs in the Source engine, and Source does something really, really weird with sky domes. I guess you wouldn't necessarily call this a sky dome, but something that's pretty unique to Valve games is that underneath any given map is a miniature model, essentially, of what ends up getting projected around the entire map. It's neat because if you go at a certain distance in the regular map, you'll hit a black void and the entire background elements will just disappear. But that's only because the whole thing is just being projected around you. And in order to go up close and personal with these background models, you have to go right to the source, which like I said, usually ends up being underneath the map. And speaking of source engine, here's a default texture that a lot of people who use hammer will immediately identify. Though in the games themselves, it's kind of rare to find this. See for the default textures, you get this grid here and it relays some information for you. It says wall 128 by 128 and the 128 by 128 is the measuring units on each square. And here's something that's really interesting. Enemies spawn well outside of a player's view at any given time. And everything is sort of attached to different loading squares throughout the entire map. So if an enemy is loaded well outside the distance and it wasn't theoretically supposed to be seen by the player yet, what you get is enemy models saved to a specific position, ready to animate in generally specific spots. But until they start moving, they're all loaded in as A-pose characters. Lots of people who watch this channel know all about T-poses, and A-poses are just a variant of that. By the way, I got one of these helicopters that were in the background, finally, on camera. I and mean, even though this one is low poly, I'm very surprised to see that for a background element, there's a texture here that you would definitely not be able to see from the distance that the game wants you to see it from. It's on the side of the helicopter, and it just says the number 23. I know that's not much, but still, it's a detail that you wouldn't be able to see. And on top of that, taking the camera this close up can show you what the detail of the helicopter is, which is another low poly model. Here's another cool little detail. When you're going through the elevator during this chapter, the elevator shaft is fully modeled, making for an enormously long elevator shaft. And 
And I say this because in most video games, the elevator shaft is merely an illusion or there's some sort of trick involved to make the elevator shaft shorter than it actually feels. But no, Valve made a legitimately long elevator shaft. Again, I love looking at Valve games just for the fact that they do things very differently over there. And then one of the later chapters where you board the plane, now there's a couple of now there's a couple of unusual things like this propeller here that's underneath the ground, but that's not the most interesting thing. <laughs> no, instead I would say this triangle is worth your time. Why why is a random triangle out of bounds worth your time? Well, this triangle was never meant to have a texture, but it does house the texture sheet for one of the airplanes. For example, this right here is the wing, and I believe this over here would be the cockpit windows. And then I wanted to take a look at some billboards and stuff like that. Like this one right here is really hilarious. It says, destroy your hunger, burger tank. And it looks like White Castle burgers being shot out of a tank. It's something that you would more than likely be able to see in different chapters of the game, but with the frenetic nature of Left 4 Dead, it's usually these details that kind of get left behind by players that are trying to frantically win the game. But feel free to let me know if you ever noticed that before. And then we got this Molotov cocktail over here. One of the things I was really surprised by is that the rag is fully modeled all the way down into the bottle. Clipping into the bottle can show you where it starts and ends, but on top of that, there seems to be like an interior model inside of the bottle. And I believe its purpose was to hide the rag if the player looked inside of the neck of the bottle. But I don't know, I'm really confused behind the purpose of what this actually was used for. Maybe it's supposed to be liquid actually, now that I think about it? If you think I'm wrong about that, feel free to let me know. 